this last folly of the philosophers, last and greatest save one, the doctrine that whatever is, is right, in every and all senses, is a libel on himself and his goodness. Finally, it seemed as if my being had been concentred or focalized to a single point, and even that soon faded out, and an utter blankness enveloped my soul. How long this continued is impossible to be told, but the next experience was that consequent upon a series of sudden thrills or shocks, like unto those which a person receives who takes hold of conducting knobs of a highly charged galvanic battery, or rather when touching a cup of a Leyden jar. These instantly aroused I started up as from a death stupor, but what a charge, if not in myself, at least in my surroundings. I was in the center of a new but limited world. Around me was an atmosphere of mellow rosy light, different from any ever known to me before, an atmosphere radiant, sweet, soft, and redolent with perfumes of an order and fineness surpassingly grateful. I was in the soul world, my soul world, a realm whereof God alone was Lord, and I his tributary queen. The feelings consequent on this induction were strange, but pleasant. The thoughts that now arose were not as formerly mere shadowy forms, inconsistent and impalpable, nor was the scene of the action within the head. True, they were born there, but that was all. They were no longer subjective merely, fleeting and ephemeral, but were objective, positive, and real. I saw, but not alone with eyes, for the simulacre of the object witnessed within that sphere, even the faint outlines of the most far-off memograph, seemed to stream in upon me through a thousand new doors, and I appeared to acquire knowledge by the two opposite methods. First, by going out involuntarily to whatever was to be known, and second, by absorbing the images of things, just as the eye absorbs a landscape. A person beholding me at the moment would have concluded, and rightly too, that I had just arisen off a sort of a cloud couch near the center of the sphere, toward which my face was turned. On that couch I beheld the exact image, not of my person, but of the clothes, the resemblance of which to those once worn on earth, it will be remembered, had so greatly surprised me in the earlier part of this experience. While yet I gazed upon the ghost of a dress, it slowly faded into nothingness. Desiring to know the rationale of this occurrence, it came to me that the worlds are not only full of objects, but must necessarily be still more full of images thereof. Images which fix themselves more or less permanently on whatever plastic material which they may chance to come in contact with. Sometimes the lightning will pass over a body or object, and, in passing, will fix and bring out into visibility the images of things already there. Nature is full of mirrors. This is the memory of matter, the photography of the substantial universe. Memory is but the photography of the soul. Everything that strikes the eye, or the senses in any way, leaves an exact image of itself upon the cylinder of the retention. Which cylinder winds and unwinds, according as it takes on or gives off the impression, whatever it may be. Thus, the image of a tone, a sound, a particular trill, as well as material things, can be and are photographed upon the soul. Nothing is lost, not even the myriad images floating off from all things about day after day. The amazing beauties of a snowstorm, a sleet shower, an autumn forest, a rich garden, the countless flowers on which man's material eye ever rested, are all safely cared for by nature's Daguerrean artist, and they float about in the material worlds until sometimes the frost will pin a few of them to the window panes in winter, or they are breathed through the spiritual atmosphere into some poetic soul who incarnates them in canvas, marble, or a deathless verse. This revelation, of course, proves that there is a higher world than most men have yet dreamed of, and that, too, right around them. In fact, all things and events are but simple process of what may be called deific photography. All forms, all things, all events are but God's thoughts fixed for a time. These mental images go forth in regular order and constitute the sublime process procession of the ages. And all human events and destinies are but the externalization of deific forehand thoughts. 
Here's the rationale of vaticination or prophecy. Certain persons are so exalted that moving in the spiritual atmosphere, which contains the pre-images of approaching events, they read a few of them, and lo, in the coming years the occurrences are enacted. For the spiritual fa phasmas have taken form. The reflected image of the deific thought has at last passed through the dark material camera, been fixed by the law of celestial chemistry, brought out to the surface of the developed or by the grand manipulators of nature's laboratory, and lo, anew the world age rejoices, though individuals and communities may mourn. There is truth, therefore, in the doctrine of foreordination, but the truth is general always and not particular. For a while the current and area of events are pre-established. Still, every soul in any and all its states has the absolute sphere of sensitivity. The law of distinctness permits it to take the utmost advantage of conditions for its own improvement. For instance, take that which constitutes a peach tree or a rose and give its successor the best possible chance to unfold its latent properties and the rose or peach principle will put forth in the course of two generations a forest of beauties, an ocean of perfume, a mine of loveliness which, judging the plants by what appeared originally, they never contained. And yet nothing is more certain than that every plant, even the prickly pear, the bristling thorn and unsightly thistle, contains the germs of a beauty too vast to be comprehended by mortal man. 